Hello everyone and welcome to Coffee with Costa video vlog number four. Um, I'm a little bit late with this week's vlog. Uh, I was had an incredibly busy week last week uh, trying to get uh, my guys ready for a special event that's coming up, uh, Parabellum Quintet 2. Uh, we have a 5-on-5 Purple Belt match versus SBG Niagara, and super pumped about this. It's going to be a great event. Really looking forward to it. We also have uh, Professor Michael Aviado from the Body of Four team, and uh, Mateo as well, who's visiting us from Colombia, who will be also participating in the event. So really looking forward to that. We had a lot of hot going on with that. We had a lot going on with the uh, preparation going to the uh, JJF Canadian Nationals that happened in Ottawa this past weekend. And, uh, you know, I, I will go further into that later on in this video vlog in which I will discuss uh, a little bit about the differences between the IBJJF and the JJF. So, uh, super excited events coming up soon and uh, let's get to it so here we go addressing question number one this week um, I had a very interesting conversation with a, a, a former student of mine a good friend about uh, when do I think a student is ready for the next belt this is a very interesting question because it's not so black and white as everybody thinks. Um, of course, ultimately, it comes down to performance. Uh, we've heard it a million times about the mats don't lie. This is a very common quote. And that is true to a certain extent. Uh, absolutely, you need to be able to perform to that level, whichever level may be, purple, brown, black, and perform efficiently, whether it's offensively or defensively, the techniques that you need to know. Now, that in itself is another story because uh, every affiliation or academy has different curriculums and different expectations from their students. But I think in general, you need to be able to perform to that level. Uh, let's go a little bit further into that. For me personally, I think that the most important thing is how well do you perform defensively first? Uh, can you hang and defend yourself against you know the upper level so if you're a blue belt and you're trying to go for purple can you defend yourself against purple belts can you hang with the purple belts but also on that being said you should you be able you should be able to also uh, control and submit and defend yourself versus the belt that you are currently in now I personally I'm not looking for total domination. I, I think that's uh, unreasonable to ask from certain individuals. But I think if you can hang in there, you know, if you are uh, doing well versus your belt level, uh, you are not getting submitted anymore or frequently by the belt you are currently in, and you are able to defend yourself uh, against the upper belts, this is a good indicator that you could you know, probably move up to the next level. Uh, but let's go even further into this. There's levels. You know, not every blue belt is the same. Not every purple belt is the same. Not every brown or black belt is the same. There's levels of commitment that comes into play. Uh, are you a competitor? Are you a casual person? Do you focus more on sport? Do you focus more on self-defense? All of these variables uh, are coming in as a factor as to whether or not I believe someone should move up in rank. 
if you're a casual competitor and you train regularly and you put in the time so this is something that a lot of people believe in and follow which is if you put in the time then you should move on to the next rank the other you know, train of thought is if you compete regularly and you win and you're doing well and you're performing uh, on that level then you can especially if you're winning tournaments of course you can be okay you, you need to move up to the next belt in order to challenge yourself and there's I think uh, it comes down to having a balance between the two I personally think that if you're a competitor there's a certain in my academy anyway in my team there's a certain level of a higher expectation what I mean by that is that if you are a blue belt and you are trying to move on to the purple belt and you are a competitor then it's results based you need to be performing and winning uh, at that belt level getting to the podium at that belt level before I promote you to the purple belt I know it seems a little bit uh, you know different as far as like okay but then you don't have the same level of expectations for the casual person no I don't I think that you know like I said it's performance based so if you are not a competitor if you are just a casual practitioner and you put in your time and you're learning the techniques and you're performing based on my previous comments uh, then you should be promoted competition is not the end-all be all of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu but I do put high expectations on competitors because they are performance they are performing they are out there competing and there's no sense in, in promoting those individuals too quickly because they're gonna run into a lot of challenges as if they move too quickly into the next belt level uh, so I think that uh, there's definitely levels to this game and and I repeat not every blue belt is the same not every purple belt is the same but th does that make them more or less deserving of that belt you know I, again it, it's not so black and white uh, this is one of the hardest and most challenging aspects of being a professor you know and it, we have to think you know about uh, come grading time for me is is a little bit stressful to be honest because I'm like okay should this person move up should that person not move up it's it's a hard decision sometimes and sometimes it's an easy decision because the person is performing so well and the maths don't lie and it makes it easy for us so for uh, uh, practitioners out there the way to make it easy on your professor to promote you to the next level is by constant regular attendance there's no magic to this you practice regularly and you will continuously improve regular attendance uh, of course there's you know other things that can help but ultimately it comes down to mat time how much time do you spend on the mat and how diligent you are with your practice and you will get to the next belt bottom line I think some of the issues that's come up and one of the things that, that for me I'm not a big fan of with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that from those early days until even today we have put the black belts on pedestals making them seem like these monsters these invincible uh, superhuman beings and I think that's a little bit unfair to many of us out there who you know have put in our time we are black belts but you know life you know you have to deal with life's issues and struggles injuries families commitments careers all these things put in a factor as to how you may perform on the mat age you know as you get older you definitely really slow down you just can't help that it's just the way it is 
So, uh, you know, we have to stop making as if like uh, black belts are supposed to be invincible. And that's not true. Uh, we're not invincible. Uh, we have bad days just like everybody else. We have bad years or months where in either injuries or uh, you haven't been practicing for a while or you stopped training for a few years, tried to come back. And that is, is can be problematic, you know. Uh, young, hungry, uh, purple belts, brown belts are going to give the casual black belts a hell of a time probably even dominate them and submit them but does that uh, make that black belt less deserving of the rank no it's way more complicated than this you know life is not so black and white it's it's a lot of gray and i think that if the person put in the time and and put in the effort and put in the hard work the sweat the dedication the sacrifices to get that black belt you know they deserve that rank but performing to the rank is a different story. You know, performing to that rank is a different story. Uh, and people need to be a little bit more uh, understanding of this. So it's, it's not a big shock when a, a young, hungry purple belt taps out a, an older black belt. It's actually supposed to be expected. As far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to teach my students to be better than me. To eventually pass me in my skill set, and if you don't, if you're not doing that, then you're not doing your students, uh, you know, justice. I want them to be eventually, you know, that old saying that uh, eventually the student passes the master. That should be 100% true. I'm trying to make my students better than I ever was. So if 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 by purple belt they're giving me a hard time or even catching me. I did my job. They're supposed to. And, uh, you know, people need to understand this a little bit better. And so when are people ready for the next belt? It's really up to each professor uh, what kind of curriculums they have, what kind of standards they've set for their students, and ultimately math time. A lot of math time. So second question of this week is, you know, a personal, not a personal one, but something I wanted to address. It wasn't so much somewhat someone asked me, even though it has come up many times. And that is uh, the difference between the IBJJF and the JJIF. And it, the, the funny thing is only now in, you know, in Canada, have we become aware in the last couple, you know, in the last two, three years, we've become aware of the JJF, the Jiu-Jitsu International Federation. You know, for the longest time, we've been, you know, solely in involved and ingrained in the IBJJF world, the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Now, there is some major differences between both federations, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But the, the one thing that's become apparent to me is just awareness. There's just not enough awareness yet of the JJIF. Now, the main differences between the JJIF versus the IBJJF is one is for profit, strictly for profit, and the other one is a non-profit entity. The IBJJF is for profit, it's privately owned, privately run, and it's strictly, you know, uh, to generate money. And, and that's understandable. You know, anything that's privately owned is going to go towards uh, making money. The JJIF is a non-profit organization recognized by Sport Accor and the IOC. So it runs the same way as all other major international uh, Olympic sport recognized uh, sports. 
So just like judo or wrestling or, you know, taekwondo, all the sports that are in the Olympics, it runs the same way. It needs to have a certain amount of countries uh, participating in those events. Uh, it needs to have, uh, you know, national qualifiers, international qualifiers, world championships, Europeans. It has the same idea, Pan, Pan Ams. However, not everyone can participate in those. You know, with the IBJJF, you know, you pay and you enter. And myself, I can go to Portugal in January, compete and become European champion, even though I don't live in Europe. No such thing with the JJF. You, the European champions, or the European championships is for European countries only, and European the people that live in Europe. Pan Ams, you know, same. Um, Asian championships, African championships, they're strictly geared to the countries that are represented in th those continents. So, like I said, it's it's just like any Olympic sport recognized uh, entity. The IBJJF, you pay, you register, you get to participate. So what do I like about both? They promote the sport that we love. They have the same rules. Both have almost identical rules, so it makes it easier for competitors to cross over from one to the other. But the big difference is, oh, let's start what I don't like about the IBJJF. It's for profit. To me, the IBJJF is not, like, for example, I'm just going to use one tournament, the IBJJF Worlds. It's not a true world championship. Well, how could you say that? Well, because it's basically U.S. versus Brazil with a sprinkle of the world. You know, there is no other major representation too much. Now, slowly, it's trickling in. But, like I said, it's U.S. versus Brazil, mainly with the sprinkle of, you know, other countries in there. And you pay, you get to participate. Not so much at Black Belts now, where they're doing these rankings, which is I think is great. So they're taking steps towards doing a better job. So there's ranking now. You have to participate in several tournaments in order to get enough points to participate or to enter into the black belt world. But any other belt is, you know, you pay, you get to participate. And I'm not a big fan of that. It also is always localized in one location. So it makes it very difficult for the rest of the world to come and participate because of expenses. This is obvious. And most athletes can't afford such big expense to travel. So a lot of the top uh, world, you know, athletes, European athletes, you know, and even South American athletes can't really go to the worlds because it's always being held in the U.S. So how can it be a world championship when it's not going around the world? So there's, there's a few things that I don't like about the IBJJF. Now, the one thing that is 100% accurate is the IBJJF has the best talent. The best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athletes in the world, 99% is competing in the IBJJF. That is for certain. Now, what I like about the JJF, to me, it's a true world championship. Only two athletes per country, per weight class. And so in the last uh, JJF tournament, I believe there was 40 or 40 something different countries. Also is just seven weight classes. No such thing as blue belt, worlds, purple belts, brown belts. No, it's just strictly weight classes, just like judo <coughs> or wrestling. So they have seven weight classes for uh, men, and I believe seven weight classes for women now. So to me, it's a true world championship. You have to qualify to go. So you have to have, uh, for example, us, we have 
provincial championships, national championships, and then that team qualifies for the world championships. So, and only two athletes per country per weight class. Um, so you have to qualify. You can't just pay your way and go. This way, you know, you have, it's a true world championship. There's each weight class will have 10 different countries represented. And, and so, it, it, like I said, it rep it's more reflective of how the Olympic, Olympic, uh, Olympics run their tournaments with judo, taekwondo, wrestling. And I think this is great. Unfortunately, uh, it does not have the best athletes participating in the JJF yet. I think that uh, both Brazil and the US they don't have a very strong uh, federation because you need to have a, a national federation and the national federation of the US and the national federation of Brazil are not quite up to par and they're not really sending athletes to JJF and I think they're just not aware you know I've spoken to many uh, American friends and they they don't know what the JJF is and I think once they do and, and once they get a little bit more organized, then they will start to, you know, have Brazil and U.S. participants in the JJF Worlds. And, uh, you know, so that is the two major differences between the JJF and the IBJJF. is just the structure of it and how it's run and how you qualify for it. And how you get to participate. I'm a big fan of both uh, for different reasons. It's some uh, some that I stated already, but I it's been my biggest one of my biggest honors to be uh, you know able to travel and coach as the national Canadian Jiu Jitsu coach and to coach a national team. In which the athletes are representing the country of Canada in the world championships not the patch that they wear on their back uh, you know and that's another uh, another thing the IBJJF to me is a team's championship it's about the patch you wear on your back it doesn't matter which country you're from uh, versus the JJF it's strictly about the country you're from and it's been the great one of my greatest honors to represent Canada as a country to see many of our Canadian athletes win world championships to see the Canadian flag uh, being raised this has been an you know a very incredible experience for me and I never had that same uh, um, pride even though I've had many athletes perform and do well in IBJJF tournaments and winning world championships at the IBJJF tournaments but you know there was a massive sense of pride going into to the JJF Worlds and I had the ability to coach athletes from seven different teams it had nothing to do with the team or gym that they trained at they were representing the country of Canada and that was pretty amazing now that brings me to another point and that's you know Politics sometimes can be a funny thing, can be, I think, politics in general always holds the sport back. And uh, we just had the Canadian National Championships in Ottawa this past weekend. And to be honest, I'm disappointed with, the, with a lot of the community because, you know, there was a lot of the first year we had this, the Nationals and Provincials. We didn't, sorry, the first year we sent a team it was a hand-picked team, but we had no choice due to time constraints. But there was a lot of flack from the rest of Canada about how, you know, why didn't we have trials, why didn't we have, uh, ch you know, provincial championships and so on and so on. Now we're th almost three years into this, and, you know, I find that some of the other provinces are not really stepping up to get involved, and I don't understand why. This is a great opportunity for their athletes, a great opportunity for the country to be represented as a whole. 
there's uh, incredible talent across the whole country and uh you know but they're not really stepping up and making an effort to participate in the national championships and i even heard some rumors that there were some boycotting from some uh some academies and professors from a particular province which to me this makes no sense uh, and it comes down to all oh, this who's running the nationals and and we're not going to support because this particular person is the one running the, or this particular entity is running the, the, the nationals and I think this just holds our sport back and you are uh, blocking the ability of your students and your you know and your athletes to represent the country that they live in and, and to have the pride to represent Canada at a world championships doing what they love to do which is jiu-jitsu uh, the one thing that I like about Ontario and, and the OJA and I'm using them as an example is I wish the rest of the country would fall in the same way because you know with the OJA I believe they organized the community works well together. All professors from even different teams have good relationships. Yes, there's rivalries, but regardless of the rivalries, there is support for all the tournaments within the Ontario Jiu Jitsu Association. Every professor, all professors go and support with attendance every single OJA tournament, regardless of who's running that tournament. And I think this is something to say about the Ontario Jiu-Jitsu community and how well we are all working together and how well we show levels of respect and how well uh, um, the tournaments are run you know versus the rest of the country there's great tournaments across Canada no doubt but I in my opinion I think the Ontario Jiu-Jitsu Association is the most organized the most well run and the, the one of the most uh, amazing communities you know where all the professors regardless of the patch on their back really come out and, and support and have good relationships with one another at least in my opinion I think I have a good relationship with all the professors in the OJA and, and I think it's great because ultimately competition should just be inside the barricades outside the barricades we need to continue to work together support one another to promote and get uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Jiu Jitsu in the mainstream uh, we're not quite there yet uh, but little by little we are trickling into the into the mainstream view uh, so but at the end of the day what it comes down to is just support jiu-jitsu you know support jiu-jitsu support the events and uh and you know whether it's IBJF or jjif just get involved and uh, stop the politic nonsense So this brings me to the professor tip of the week. Whatever it is that's happening in your community and wherever you live, support Jiu Jitsu. Support Jiu Jitsu events, regardless of who's running them. Whether you like that person or not, that's not the point. The point is to support the athletes that are participating in these events. The point is to support to, to in order for Jiu Jitsu to grow. And this is, I think, uh, the most important thing. You know. So everyone out there, go support events. Whether you're it's regular tournaments, whether it's special events like Parabellum Quintet, who, by the way, is a sold out show. Great to hear. The uh, community is really coming around to supporting this event. And I really, really like just super happy to be involved. So uh, I love, I'm loving that, you know, big support for this event. And I would just would like to see this kind of support with all of the other events in Ontario, whether it's in-house tournaments, whether it's uh, super fight events, whether it's tournaments, get out there, get involved, support, uh, you know, and this is the only way that Jiu Jitsu is going to continue to grow and let's get jiu-jitsu in the main in mainstream in the in the minds of all these big uh you know media outlets and so on uh, we need to create a buzz 
And sometimes the best way to create a buzz is with support to these events. And the more these events grow, the more eyes get on it, the more eyes get on it. Someone from these bigger, uh, either newspapers or TV or uh, channels or whatever, will come around and start to wonder, hey, what's going on over here? Why is this growing? Why is it uh, getting such a buzz? And, you know, as much as we love jujitsu and as much as, uh, you know, we think we're getting somewhere, we're just scratching the surface. We are nowhere near, you know, the main stream mindset so let's keep working let's keep getting involved get out there support the events uh, so that's my tip of the week you know uh, don't just stick to your little academy get out there and support the event regardless of who's running Wuss.